Legion, it's Hadrian. Thank you for being here and welcome back to Strategy School and Civilization VI Rise and Fall. Don't forget to check out the series overview if you're watching for the first time. This episode is going to focus exclusively on governors, loyalty, and free cities, which really, it sounds like three different topics. It's maybe two, but it's one massive system that's been added in the Rise and Fall expansion. If you do not own Rise and Fall, what I'm about to say and what we talk about when it comes to governors, loyalty, and free cities for the rest of the series does not apply to you. This was added exclusively in Rise and Fall. So we're going to talk about that this episode, and then we're going to play until we unlock our great prophet and can found a religion, which I know for a fact, and I'll tell you why next episode, is going to happen before we hit the end of the ancient era. So it'll allow us to talk about founding a religion and getting that done before we talk about the rise and fall features of ages in Civilization VI and how they are different from, you know, vanilla Civilization VI and how they're different from Civilization V, etc. So we, at the end of the last episode, unlocked... Actually, before I get to that, let me just mention very quickly. Notice that we have a notification down here. Frederick Barbarossa has enforced his borders. So our scout got kicked out, basically. Um, just because he finally researched whatever civic it was, uh, early empire. So he actually got to that before we did. He went for that instead of state workforce, perhaps. And so his borders are now solid, and we can no longer just walk around in his territory. I'm going to move this scout away. And I'm going to take the somewhat risky step. There's a lot of fog of war in front of me. Okay, there's nothing out this direction. I would like to look this way because, again, we are training a couple of settlers. And I would like to be able to maybe expand with a new city on the coast here by this river so we can get that fresh water. So, anyway, let's talk now about governors because we've unlocked the governor tab. And this first part of the video will go relatively quickly because governors are pretty straightforward to explain. Let me explain by describing a concept you might have heard about if you are familiar with strategy gaming in general or maybe have just spent some time out in the community. You might have heard about the concept of playing wide versus playing tall in Civilization VI. And this applies to really any kind of strategy game where you control territory. But it essentially refers to the difference in play style between playing for a bunch of territory and playing for a minimal amount of territory while trying to build up your forces and build up your civilization, to use this particular example, as much as possible. So if you're playing tall, you're not really trying to expand your territory outward and control all of the world. You just want to have a small, self-sufficient nation that is extremely advanced. And a good strategy game will allow players the opportunity to do both. One game that I play a lot on the channel is Stellaris, and Stellaris allows ample opportunities and has lots of mechanics built in to allow players who decide not to conquer a lot of territory to keep up with players who do. So that's kind of the basic concept is that in any good strategy game, including Civilization VI Rise and Fall, you should be able to win by either playing wide or playing tall. Governors are Rise and Fall's answer to a problem, really, with vanilla Civilization VI, which was really that the way to win was by playing wide. So you would just conquer as much territory as you could. There wasn't really a viable means to play tall in Civilization VI Vanilla. But with governors, we've taken a massive step in the right direction. So we have earned a governor title with our most recent civic research. Just one governor title. Each governor title allows you to appoint a new governor in one of your cities or promote an existing governor. So again, playing wide versus playing tall. You could have just a few governors that are very highly promoted and have very advanced abilities. We'll take a look at what some of these are in just a second. Or you could use all of your titles to have a number of governors. You can only have this many. It's always these seven governors. And each of them has specific abilities that kind of tend to a certain style of play. So there's a military governor, there's a diplomatic governor, there is a religious governor, there is a growth-related governor, there's a construction-related governor, there's a science and culture-related governor, and there's an economic-related governor. Uh, that's, that's the basic breakdown of what all of these are. And each governor, as you can see, they all have certain things in common. There are a few things different in that Victor here only takes three turns to become established in a city, but most governors take five turns to become established with their basic benefit. And every governor has a basic benefit you get right out of the gate, which is acquired as soon as they're established simply by using your first governor title to appoint them. 
So they get this first benefit. For instance, Magnus gets or provides plus 50% yields from plot harvests and feature removals in the city that you assign him to. So if you harvest plots, so if you take away woods, if you take away a marsh, if you harvest wheat or rice or cattle or sheep, then you will get an extra 50% on that yield because Magnus is your governor. You have to have him fully established, so you have to put him in the city and wait five turns, but you will have that bonus after he's established. Also, every single governor immediately provides eight loyalty per turn towards your civilization in that city. This does not wait for the establishment. This is a very, very important concept that I'm explaining to you right now, especially in warfare. If you didn't catch what I just said, rewind 10 seconds. <laughs> I'll say it again anyway. This loyalty bonus, the eight loyalty per turn that you get from having a governor in a city, is instantaneous. It does not have to wait five turns in order to apply. So all of this stuff, you have to establish the governor, but you can, as soon as you realize you've got a city or maybe you've just conquered a city, you want to make sure it goes ahead and builds up loyalty toward you, then you can send a governor to that city and instantly it'll start providing another eight loyalty per turn to make sure that that city starts to become loyal to you as opposed to falling back into the hands of the enemy. So that's essentially what governors do. Again, if you take the route of just going with a few governors, two or three or four governors tops, then you can promote those four governors that you have more. You can sink your new governor titles into promoting the governors and giving them their best abilities. The end game technologies, I think it might be the end game civic, not the end game tech, or it might be both. It might just be the civic provide one governor title every time you research it repeatedly. So when you get to the very end of the game, it is also possible just to keep improving all of your governors. And eventually, if you're playing, you know, past the end of a victory, you could have every governor fully upgraded with every ability, which is crazy to think about. That would only be in seven of your cities, but you can go that route if you wanted to. But the point is that would be at the end of a game, most likely after a victory. That's not something that a player will be able to do in order to help them win. Otherwise, the whole thing I started with talking about playing wide versus playing tall, it, this whole system wouldn't really be a solution to that if people could just appoint all the governors and give all the abilities because then you would still be trying to get the maximum possible number of governors and cities as opposed to thinking in terms of, ah, no, I just want a few governors that I want to fully promote while we are in the victory chasing portion of this game. So we are for Uruk. Like I said, we have several options, and I guess I'll go through a few more details here so you, you can know like what my thinking is. We have one governor title available, so we can appoint one governor. This is our military governor. We can put him in place, and in three turns, he will increase the city garrison's combat strength by five. So it's quite nice, uh, especially if I were feeling threatened, but I'm not feeling threatened at the moment. Amani is, she can actually be established at a city-state as a diplomat, and she can instantly give us two additional envoys. So if we wanted to become suzerain of Toronto right now, we could appoint Amani to that particular governor. We could also appoint her to a city and get some of her benefits, which are mainly loyalty-based benefits. We'll talk about loyalty in just a second. And also notice she has an amenities ability as well. So each of the abilities that follow from the base ability kind of are related to the governor's basic function. Pingala, for instance, is the educator, so he's focused on increasing science and culture in a city. All of his benefits, I'm just going to scroll through these, not read them, but you can take a look yourself. We're going to talk about great people next episode. We also need to talk about space projects, or not space projects, just city projects, uh, before too much longer, but there's it's not really time just yet. But all of this is related, as you can see, to high technology and culture, theater squares, campus production bonuses, things that improve your science and culture yields in a city. So we are going to go for our first governor with Magnus. Magnus is a good governor if you would like your cities to grow quickly. You could also go for Liang if you want your first governor. You can go for Reina, and she acquires new tiles and cities faster. So she will help boost you financially if you want more gold. But we're going to go with Magnus because he will start providing us. Look at his first upgrade. Once we have another title available, which will be fairly soon, we will be able to boost growth in the city we place him in by 20%. Also, trade routes entering or ending at that city will provide an additional two food to their starting city. So having Magnus in your capital is a great way, if you have internal trade routes, to have your civilization grow early on. Because if your trade routes are connected to your capital and they start at your 
outlying cities, then those trade routes will have an additional two food added to them. And your capital already is going to be a large city, so it's going to be providing a good amount of food to begin with. So that is a great way. Magnus is a great way using this particular promotion to grow an early empire. And we'll talk more about his bonuses as we continue. But we're going to go with Magnus, who is the steward. And now we have the option of promoting him, of placing him in Uruk or Ur. Notice that the game is telling me what our loyalty per turn will change to in that city if we appoint him. Again, that's because he is providing another 8 loyalty, and that just shows us what the base amount is versus what it will be. So this is going to be more useful if we were maybe on the cusp of not having positive loyalty per turn. These numbers are not particularly um, useful for me early on. When you assign a governor, you'll see if you're replacing another governor. Right now, of course, we're not because this is our first one. And there we go. So he is going to be established in five turns, and then he will start providing his bonus, which again, if we click on the governor part of the tile there, you can see... Hang on, did that pull up both there? No, it didn't. It just pulled up the loyalty tile automatically. So he is a groundbreaker. So again, in five turns, anything I... any plot that I harvest, or any feature that I remove, so if I wanted to chop down trees, I would get an additional 50% production. Remember what I said about chopping down trees with builders? Imagine how much that would help me build certain things, or how much overflow that might help provide as I build units and get buildings. I mean, it's, it's insane how much Magnus can help out in the early game, so just be aware of that. But having talked about that, let's now talk about an even more important aspect of this episode, which is the all-important topic of loyalty. Loyalty allows players to gain new cities by more peaceful means. This was added in Civilization VI Rise and Fall. The loyalty value is capped at 100 for each city. I'm not going to go into the loyalty interface just yet because I want to explain the basics to you and then show you how they play out. You'll see what I mean in the loyalty interface. Loyalty is capped at 100 for each city and bottoms out at zero. So pretty straightforward. You can have a fully loyal city at 100 loyalty or you can have a city that is no longer loyal to you and is rebelling in the process of rebelling when it hits zero loyalty. Cities develop loyalty each turn according to loyalty pressure and also loyalty per turn. You saw loyalty per turn when we appointed Magnus. Uruk's loyalty per turn is now going to be at 29 simply because we appointed him. We don't have to wait five turns. It went from 21 to 29. You'll see that again in just a moment. Loyalty per turn comes from whatever combination of governors, units, buildings, policies, citizens, and other bonuses are affecting each city's loyalty. That's loyalty per turn. Loyalty pressure is exerted per turn, just like loyalty per turn, but it's exerted per turn on a by-citizen basis and is modified by distance. Let me say that again. Loyalty pressure is exerted per turn on a by-citizen basis and is modified by distance. During a normal age, all citizens in a city exert one loyalty pressure. Citizens in a capital city exert an additional one pressure. So in Uruk, it would actually be not five pressure exerted, but 10 pressure exerted. These totals are then modified downward by 10% per tile you move away from the city. So right here, this would be a 90% modification. So it would be when we're looking at you know, 10 loyalty pressure being exerted, this would be 9 loyalty pressure. 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. So hang on, let's make sure that we're doing this correctly. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. Yep. So this, these are the 9 tiles over which Uruk exerts loyalty pressure. All the way over here, Uruk is exerting loyalty pressure. Just not a lot. But it is a small amount. These totals, or rather, citizen pressure is capped at 20, and there are other ways to exert loyalty, such as by way of monuments. We have built monuments in both cities, and so we are going to see some benefits from that in just a moment. Pay close attention, though, as you learn the game, to find different ways to change loyalty per turn and loyalty pressure. Also, you should understand the difference between loyalty per turn and loyalty pressure. Loyalty per turn, again, is a combination of factors that involves your citizens, but it's also involves your, it also involves your buildings, it also involves your governor, and it just determines the loyalty for a specific city. Whereas loyalty pressure is the loyalty that is exerted on other cities by a given city. Understanding both and how they're affecting the cities around you is important to understanding the loyalty game. So one thing you might be thinking about, we opened this episode talking about playing wide versus playing tall. That's, very, that's a very common topic of discussion in civilization circles. 
Another very common term that you might have heard playing Civilization VI is forward settling. This is a very popular practice in Civilization games, especially if you're really trying to antagonize an opponent, whether you're playing against a human being or playing against a computer opponent. What forward settling essentially is, let's say we finished our settler here in Uruk, and I put this settler like right up on Germany's borders, just to say, hey, bring it on. Like, you gotta, you're gonna have to fight me or I'm gonna have you boxed in. It's a way to kind of not only be extremely aggressive and dominant over other civilizations, but it's a way to box in the growth of another civilization so that you can ensure their focus is on you and you can grow your empire in the back. Here's the thing. That's what forward settling is typically about. But now that loyalty is now a factor, especially with capital cities exerting double loyalty per citizen, well, it's not literally double, it's just one extra loyalty per citizen. That's an important distinction. So just remember that because capitals don't double the loyalty. It just adds another plus one per citizen. So with that being added, if I were to forward settle Aachen, the city that I put there would fall to his capital quickly. And actually in the settler interface, you would see loyalty pressure. Here it is. You would see loyalty pressure applied from Aachen. Notice the amount of loyalty pressure. So we're starting to see in the interface some interesting differences. You would think, okay, well, I'm going to go over this in just a second using stuff I've already written down. But we're going to talk about these numbers and where these numbers come from in just a second because it can, it can throw you off, definitely, when you think about what I just explained. So all of that being said, the math on this and what we were just looking at doesn't quite work out in the current version of the game. Using everything I just explained to you, let's look at our two cities. You'd expect Uruk to exert five, so this is Uruk right here, five citizens, five times two because it's the capital, so it's one per turn plus another one, so it's two loyalty per turn, five times two minus 50% pressure on Ur because that's five tiles away. So that's going to exert five loyalty pressure per turn on Ur. You would expect Ur to exert three times one minus 50%, which is 1.5 loyalty per turn on Uruk. Each city's own citizens exert full pressure on the city itself, which is 10 in Uruk and 3 in Ur. So you'd expect 8 loyalty pressure per turn in Ur, because you have the 5 coming from Uruk and the 3 from its citizens, and you'd expect 11.5 in Uruk. But let's look at the interface, and you can click on the loyalty part of the city bar. And this is the best way to get to it. You can also go to City Details and go to the Loyalty tab. But let's just click on the loyalty bar. Notice that pressure from nearby citizens in Uruk is actually 20. And it caps at 20, by the way, if I didn't mention that earlier. It's capped at 20. Now let's go over to Ur. Also 20. So, doesn't quite add up. But everything I told you in spirit is accurate in that pressure is exerted, again, per turn on a bi-citizen basis and is modified by distance. When you come down to Aachen and look at the settler map, you can see how the loyalty pressure from Aachen is being reduced as you get farther away from the city. Now, there might be another city over here that is exerting loyalty pressure. I don't, I doubt that there is. I feel like, again, they got their settler captured. We mentioned that in the last episode. But the numbers, as much as they don't quite match to the literal math, Understanding that it is exerted per turn on a bi-citizen basis and modified by distance, regardless of how the math works out, will help you understand how to keep your cities loyal. You want to make sure that cities are relatively nearby to the rest of your civilization so they can have the loyalty pressure from multiple other cities. And you want to make sure that you are assigning governors and other means of obtaining loyalty per turn to each city in your empire. I want to emphasize the importance of using the interface and tooltips as well when you are trying to work on loyalty because this interface, when you pull it up, before you even look over here and start looking at the breakdown of where your loyalty problems are coming from, you can see the amount of loyalty the city has. By the way, cities with mixed loyalty below 75 will become increasingly unproductive and the population growth will slow. And then cities that drop all the way down to zero will eventually revolt 
which leave your empire to become free cities, which I'm going to talk about in just a second as I conclude here. But, um... Here's the thing with the information that is shown to you here. You can point to the loyalty arrow on any city, regardless of whether it's yours or someone else's. Notice that city-states get a huge loyalty bonus so that it's harder to convert them. And you can really track how much each individual city's loyalty is rising or falling towards a given source. You can also see when a city is a free city, which city it's about to fall to if loyalty continues to be a problem. So we're going to see more about this as the game continues. But that's those are the basics of how governors and loyalty work. Let's talk very quickly about free cities just so you have a basic primer on this. We will see some of these later in the campaign, almost certainly. Free cities might transition quickly to other civilizations. They typically do in this game. Or they might grow strong enough to maintain their freedom. I don't know that that'll happen on Prince Difficulty, but you never know how the difficulty setting will affect different things. Free cities that become fully loyal to a nearby power. So once, again, free cities are cities that have lost loyalty to you and have revolted. So they will be black and red in color. All of them will be. They, by the way, cannot... You can't trade with a free city. They won't try to expand their territory, but they will be hostile to anyone entering their territory. So free cities that revolt and then become fully loyal, so their, their loyalty pressure continues to drop because of the presence of another civilization nearby, they will be given the opportunity to join that civilization. And all of their units, if they do join, will automatically be disbanded. It is possible for a player to reject a free city's attempt to join. In that case, loyalty pressure will no longer be applied from your civilization, which is pretty cool. There's not really a gameplay mechanic in place right now that encourages that, really. Um, but in spirit, what you can do is you can say, well, I'm going to say no, you should have your freedom. And as a matter of fact, I'm going to revoke any pressure that I exert on you by virtue of you know, my city's being near you. So it, it basically helps that city-state remain free, at least as far, or not city-state, but that free city remain free for the rest of the game because you made that decision. As long as we're talking about the loyalty pressure exerted by you threatening their freedom. If another civilization is nearby and starts exerting loyalty pressure on the free city, it can still be flipped. This is where the term culture flipping comes from, if you've ever heard it, by the way. We've talked about a couple of different... Uh, colloquialisms in the Civilization VI community. We've got playing wide versus playing tall. We've got culture flipping, of course, and then we talked about forward settling. So that's the basic rundown of this three-topic, one-topic video on governors and loyalty. Let's play for a bit until we unlock our great profit. Let's see. Technology tree. We have just finished mining, so now we can build mines on hills. We can build quarries on special resources, and we can chop down woods and harvest copper. I'm going to go ahead and research bronze working so I can have the ability to build a an encampment district. I do want horsemen. Yes, I do. Absolutely. But I won't be able to train them until the district is in place, so I'd rather have that done first. Civic-wise, uh, I'm going to go for early empire. Again, my priority here, we're going to get another governor title in four turns, which is nice. My priority here is to go for political philosophy as soon as I can. We haven't met three city-states, so this is not boosted, unfortunately, but political philosophy will give us access to the next levels of government. It will happen in the next um, age, but it'll be a pretty nice addition to things. This warrior, I'm going to send them a little farther south. I'm going to put this archer up on those plains hills. This archer is still healing. And this warrior we're going to put on this hilltop. He'll uncover a little bit of land, but not much. We need to explore up north of Toronto because there is probably a barbarian encampment up there. Next turn. Again, when we get to the next episode, I will explain how I'm so certain that we're going to get to have our religious unit before we get to the ancient era in this game. I'm going to send my archer down here, basically using him as a sentry, putting him on a hilltop. This archer is also healed up. Interesting. They might have cleared the encampment because I don't know that there's anything going on up there. We'll find out. Ah, barbarian. Okay, so I'm going to move you here. Because you're on a hilltop, you'll have more visibility, but you're also... There's some hills between me and the barbarian, so that scout is protected. Man, that scout's come a long way. He was all the way over here 
not too long ago. You went fly in this direction. Hello, Barbarian. You are just in time to help give my new archer some experience. Thanks for that. And we're standing on a hilltop too, so if he attacks me, I'm going to have the advantage there. So our settler is done in Uruk, and we also now have one fewer population there. So if I take this settler, I do think I want to have a city down this direction. I would like to put one in the shadow of Mount Kilimanjaro, if I can manage it. This grassland would actually be a really nice location. So let's give that order. All right, now I have the option. I'm going to go ahead and build a granary so we have the extra food and housing. We're a little bit behind on that. Normally you'd build a little bit sooner in the game, but let's cross this river. Yeah, I'm increasingly convinced that the barbarian encampment up here has already been cleared. Oh, hello. All right, so we've got a barbarian scout. I'm just using this guy to... We're going to try and get this scout home before he gets hurt. Should be okay. Toronto has spawned some new units, but it looks like otherwise we might be safe-ish. All right, this archer, as you can see here, can't fire over these hills, if I didn't explain that earlier. They have a range of two, but when there's hills involved, those can be rather problematic for aiming at things at a distance. And unfortunately, we do have a barbarian over here that... Hang on. This settler might get captured, actually. That might have been a bad move. Because these woods are going to prevent me from... Yeah, this barbarian's going to probably beeline for that settler. If he doesn't, we'll be okay. But that wasn't the smartest move on my part. I should have moved the settler back. But I'm really eager to get down that direction. I could move... Well, let's get this scout moving. That'll help. Speaking of scouts... Let's step up here. We've uncovered a little bit more of that area. And it does seem as though... Oh, wait, hang on. There, there is something going on up here. There is a land bridge. I shouldn't have assumed. You know what they say about assumptions. Okay, the barbarian is beelining for my settler. It was luxuries like air conditioning that brought down the Roman Empire. With air conditioning, their windows were shut. They couldn't hear the barbarians coming. Notice we've unlocked a new military policy called Limitane. Plus two loyalty per turn for cities with a garrison unit. Pretty cool, huh? I'm not going to go for that. We're going to keep the barbarian fighting bonus for now, because we are still fighting barbarians, if you haven't noticed. But I will move this settler here. That will actually protect... ...that settler. I didn't think about that. Moving them onto that hilltop help keep them safe. I'm going to step over here with this... Ah, oh, damn it. Okay, so that this scout could be in trouble. We're going to find out in a bit. Now I'm going to go straight for political philosophy so that I have the new government styles as soon as possible. And governor title. Let's go ahead and promote Magnus and improve growth in our capital city. Now we could also go for provision first. 20% towards industrial zone buildings, but we don't have an industrial zone yet. Settlers trained in the city do not consume a population is useful to me right now, but I'm not focused on that. 20% growth in the city. And by the way, Magnus is fully established now, or he will be in one turn. You can say, I, I thought he was fully established, but we haven't played that much yet. How close are we? Almost there. Let's see if we can spot this encampment. All right, good. Our scout has arrived to, to protect our settler. So the settler did, in fact, survive. Thankfully, the terrain in the area helped guarantee that. The barbarian will probably still come this way. Or, no, he was dumb enough to come that way. Okay. I'm also interested in creating a lasting legacy. Because bronze will last for thousands of years. Okay, so now I have access to the ability to build a barracks in an encampment district. We can train spearmen. And we have... Well, we've uncovered... Well, there, we, we do see some iron, but it's in the fog of war, so there's some iron over here. I'm going to need to get a city over that direction in, in order to exploit that. We've uncovered our first new strategic resource, which will help with some of the more advanced units we're going for. Let's now go for horseback riding, so that we can have our horsemen as soon as possible. 
And I think I would like to go ahead and get the library built. Notice this is providing plus two science, plus one citizen slot, and a great scientist point per turn. Next episode will be all about what that means. I'm going to move our settler one tile down. This scout should actually be able to fight, so I'm going to let them get some combat experience. There's a promotion available for one of those archers, that's good news. Alright, can't move anywhere with this warrior, so let's send you here. 30 minute episode here, we need to stop, don't we? We're gonna get this scout out of danger. And go to the next turn, and something very, very cool is about to happen. And it's not the transition to the engineer. There goes that barbarian warrior, no longer a threat. There we go! We have a great person available to us, and we will be able to found a religion in the next episode. But for now, I'll stop this one here so we can talk about great people and what that means, what all these great people points are about. Because something has been happening throughout the entire background of this series so far, the first 40 turns we've played through together, that I haven't explained to you yet. And next episode, it's going to happen. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed it, don't forget to like the video and subscribe to follow along. New episodes are coming out every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at 7 a.m. Eastern Time. Comments are always welcome. Let me know what you think, and I will see you next time.